this Sunday. What's up? Hello. Hi, Roman. All right, so I think we should be live. Hello, everybody. Hope you're having a wonderful Sunday. Where are all of you tuned in from? Good to hear that you guys are here. We are live on YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, Facebook. And I'm straight from the airport. I came back from Dallas today. Wow. Australia, Florida, friends from Hawaii, fantastic. So happy to see you guys. Anybody here on YouTube or on Twitch? I'm seeing all these comments, so uh, say hi, and I'd love to know where you guys are tuned in from. Hi, Clemens. Hi, Stan. Texas. I was just there. I was in Dallas. I had a great time performing at the Riverfront Jazz Fest in Dallas, Texas. It was hot, 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 95 degrees. <laughs> Sunny Sundays with me, Grace Kelly. Sunny Sundays with Grace Kelly. Grab your tea, or if you prefer coffee. Sunny Sundays, sunny Sundays. Or maybe I should say, the sun setting sunny Sundays. It's not really sunny now. I think it's like, it's beautiful out. It's starting to be a romantic Sunday. <laughs> I have my, t my tea and super excited to hang out with you guys. Hello, Austin, Khalid, Renee, Chase. Where are you guys tuned in from? Hi, Glenn. Thanks for tuning in. So yeah, wonderful time in Dallas. It was hot, 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 95 degrees. Uh, we played yesterday afternoon, and they had some other fantastic performers. Erica Badu was headlining. Uh, Hiroshima, got to say hi to my friends. Hiroshima at the hotel, they were performing. And the festival is happening all this weekend, but it was a quick in and out for my band. We got in Thursday night, and then, yeah, performed Saturday night. Had some awesome tacos after. We went to a place called Blue taco and had frozen margaritas and I learned that I probably should never have frozen margaritas they are so tasty in the moment can I get thumbs up on that <laughs> some hearts yeah I mean I love the way frozen margaritas taste especially since we were sitting outside and it was hot and but my god I woke up with the worst hangover this morning I'm not a big drinker at all friends so when I tell you that <laughs> I work, I literally woke up with the worst splitting headache and I only had half a, half a cup. So I think I'm going to stick to my half a glass of wine. I was trying, uh, trying to be summery and enjoy the tacos and margaritas, but my body didn't feel the same way. Hello, William. Hi, Stan from San Francisco. Oh, I love San Fran. Wow, Manda is tuned in from Johannesburg. It's 1 a.m. Ah, I love that you're hanging out with us, with me at 1 a.m. So I was on the plane this morning, flying back with a splitting headache. I took a couple of Tylenols, and uh, I just tried to fall asleep. But the girl next to me started spraying perfume. <laughs> and also doing, like, other hygiene things, um, which I thought was definitely a little different. Um, I think maybe you should save those things for your personal space, you know, or at least the bathroom. Uh, so that woke me up, but I feel a lot better now. My headache's gone, and now I'm hanging out with you guys. So there we go. La Marita is here for my Facebook, YouTube, Twitch friends. She's on the couch. 
Hello, Jeffrey. Hi, Chase from Indiana. We have friends from Oregon. Love it. I'm going to be in Eugene, Oregon, Renee, uh, later in the fall. So I also had a really fun week of gigs. It's hard to believe that everything's gotten packed in. Um, I think last Sunday I told you that I was performing in Camden, New Jersey the next day. So that was, yeah, Monday. I performed in Camden, New Jersey slash Philly. It was so much fun. Big outdoor park, beautiful summer night. Band played awesome. And wow, we had such a great audience. Everyone was so, so much fun, hooting and hollering, dancing. Hello, Sky. Hi, Sunny. Hi, Bob Doolittle. Wow, you have a great name. Bob, I think we've met before. I remember your name. There's not many people named Bob Doolittle. Have we met at a live show? Uh, we got some more friends coming in on Instagram and on YouTube. I don't know if anyone's tuned in on Twitch yet. Um, so great time in Camden, New Jersey. And then, oh, one of my favorite moments in that is near the end of the set, I went out to the crowd and I started just jamming. This is my favorite part of every live performance of mine, just jiving with you guys out in the audience. You know, I think that the, the stage is a barrier sometimes, especially in performances that I'm just feeling all of the love from the crowd and, and I just, I want to get in it. <laughs> so I walked off stage and I literally started shimming with a bunch of ladies and we passed out some more blow up saxophones and I started playing and they were all dancing with me and then my friend Tim, Tim are you online? Well you'll probably see this later who's also part of my Pledge Music family. He brought his bright green wig. It was amazing. So I put up a clip on my Instagram. It, I just started laughing so hard. So he started to like dance with me with his bright green wig and then his wig started falling off and then like everybody started gathering and it was really funny. <laughs> Honestly, anything <clears throat> to make laughter happen is a beautiful thing in my book. Hi, David. Hi, David Briggs. Hello, Patricio and Sky from Morocco. What? So cool. Hi, Lucas. Thank you so much, Silent. On Instagram, Silent70 said, Your music warms my heart. So sweet. Somebody's requesting a little Donnelly. Yeah, that's a great one. So we had a dance party, an impromptu dance party. It was fantastic. The audience was moving, grooving. I was moving and grooving. And then when I was in Dallas, I also went out to the crowd because everyone was just being so loud and fantastic and filling the room with hoots and hollers. And I spent like a whole song out there with the audience. It was so much fun. I mean, I could have spent half my set out there. There's something really magical that happens when I get to step out to the audience and lock eyes with people that I'm playing to and just see their smiles and then see them start to shimmy. And it's this beautiful moment where... We're all giving each other permission to just have so much fun and to completely celebrate the music and be goofy and smile and dance. Again, like any time that there's laughter and that there's love in the air is what I, that's what I, I live for. I live for those moments and to be able to, to share those beautiful moments with strangers who then a lot of times become friends. I meet a lot of you after the show, but in that moment of like, you know, dancing together and, and, and smiling, I don't know a lot of you, and, and it becomes this very precious, beautiful moment, and it's just etched in my memories of so many <laughs> great times that that's happened in different cities. So thank you all for being an amazing fans and audience and bring in the love. I like to say that the audience makes a show great. It, let me say that again. The audience is the reason why 
some of my shows really take off and are full of energy and we can bring 200% when we feel the love from all of you from the stage. So that is, you know, there's some shows that I walk out on stage and right from the beginning everyone is just like, woo, and it feels so good. So remember that every time you're at a show. I try to remember that as an audience member too. I always try to hoot and holler because you are part of the performance as the audience. We need you. As performers need you, right? For my other artist friends, isn't that so true? Yes, I'm seeing those hearts. <laughs> Adopt in laws are watching from Illinois. <laughs> oh my gosh. I am sending so much love to you guys. My boyfriend is in the next room. <laughs> it's okay. We can all just be big adoptive families. I think at this point I have like three adoptive moms and aunts and uncles and just wonderful fans that have turned into friends and have turned into family. <laughs> um, somebody's saying. This is one of the moments where I kick myself for forgetting my headphones at home when I'm at work. Ah, you're watching us at work. You're watching. I keep saying us. I guess me and my saxophone, that can be us and La Marita. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> Thank you guys. Somebody is saying I love your videos and music with Leo. Leo's amazing. And another person's asking about Leo, what's his personality like? I usually don't hear him talk unless he's on an interview. He is a fantastic human being. He is full of so much energy and he's just one of those people that brings everyone to his level of energy and excitement and like being around him is just like his music, his fireworks going off. It, it's a it's a joy. Cody Smith, hi, Grace. Skelly, how many times have you been asked to play the Pink Panther? Love from England. Ah, so cool. England. I've only been to England once. I would love, I've been to London. I'd love to go back one of these days. I have to say I have a big love for UK house music. So it would be really cool. I've always thought that was one of the places that I'd love to spend extended time. I just think I'd soak up a lot of the music and yeah, uh, how many times have I been asked to play the Pink Panther? I don't know if it's coming as a request many times. Um. So I actually have a really fun story about the Pink Panther. When I, before I started saxophone, it was one of the songs that I, th I loved and I always thought about the saxophone with it. And so I was with my parents. I think I was like eight, eight years old. And we were in New York City. I I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts. But we would, my parents would take me and my sister to New York a couple times a year. And we get to see Broadway plays. And my mom would be here for business. Uh, and we just get to, you know, walk around Times Square and do all the tourist stuff. And I remember this one time we passed the street performer, the street saxophonist, and I walked up to him and I gave him some money and he started to play the Pink Panther as I was walking away and I freaked out because I was like, oh my God, it's one of my favorite songs. <laughs> and then I was like, that's the song I would want to play when I start saxophone. So once I started saxophone, I did learn the Pink Panther. So it's funny that you mention it. It's a very special song to me and I'm glad you requested it. Oh, we have a friend from Twitch to make a song. Hi, thank you so much for tuning in. Yes, we're definitely gonna play some music here. We got some other great song requests coming in. 
to Paul on YouTube. Especially now that I'm back home. There's something so special about New York, I have to say. Every time I come back from my travels and I come back home and I look at the skyline and people are just moving, man. It is so busy. The hustle is real. I mean, as soon as we land and I'm getting out of LaGuardia Airport, it's just like, and suitcases and people are like, I remember when I first moved to New York, I kept thinking that. I was going to get trampled. Have you guys been to New York City? Anybody? Little Hearts? Um, by the way, that was a great song suggestion. Thank you guys for keeping them coming. Hi, Thomas from New Orleans. So if you have not been to New York before, first of all, you need to come. It's an incredible city. But it's just so busy. And I remember the first time I moved here and I started to take the train, I would very often miss my stop and I just would suddenly be going somewhere else because the trains move so fast too. Like if you don't know where you're getting off, the doors open and then they close and then suddenly you're like all the way up in Harlem or like down in Brooklyn. So there were a lot of moments where just people were moving in and out and Times Square was so crazy. And then the other thing that amazed me about New Yorkers is, is that people would literally be reading a book while standing on the subway and listening to music <laughs> with their earbuds and... It was just amazing to me that they could just multitask like that. And I remember the first time I tried to do that. <laughs> I like, tried to put in my earbuds and read something just to see if I could do it. And then, like, I missed my stop. And then, you know, I probably, like, dropped the book. And But sure enough, like, now I'm, I can do, like, I can read and listen to music and get off at the right stop. So baby steps, friends, right? That being said... None of us are good at multitasking or multifocusing, so it's not necessarily the best thing to be reading and what, you know. There's a high, much higher likelihood that you're going to miss your stuff. Okay, anyways, that was my end of rant about New York City. That all came from your great song suggestion about New York's state of mind and how much I love New York. I also really love the West Coast so much. Oh my God, those avocados are so fresh and so good. Hello, Frederico. Ooh, please play some Brazilian music, yeah. I actually started saxophone originally because of the great tenor saxophonist Stan Getz, and I listened to a lot of Joe Beam's music. Quiet nights and quiet stars Quiet chords from my guitar Floating in a silence that surrounds us Quiet nights and quiet streams And a window that looks out To Corcovado Oh, how lovely This is where I want to be Close to you, so close to me Until the final flicker of life's ember Thank you. 
We'll get back to Brazilian music because I could get lost in it. Hi, Dad. My dad is saying he loves when I sing and play Brazilian songs. Oh, well, thanks to you and Mom for playing lots of great Brazilian music when I was younger, getting it into my ears and my heart. Seven, oh, you can't hear my lyrics. Uh, that was actually a Joe Beam song called Corcovado, and it would sound so much better in Portuguese if I sang Portuguese. Actually, there's one song that I learned completely in Portuguese. Você viu só que amor nunca se voz assim e passou nem parou mas olha só para mim se voltar vou atrás vou pedir vou falar vou contar que amo vou pedir vou okay I forgot that part anyways I learned that <laughs> I haven't sang that song in a really long time that's um, the English translation is so nice. Uh, okay, I'm forgetting the English lyrics too. Anyways, that was a little bit of Portuguese for my friends who were requesting. Um, hello, Michael, and thank you for these great comments, everybody. I cannot sing in Spanish so well. I'm going to save that. Let me work on that. Great question, though. Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, I want to make sure I'm seeing all of these comments. Great questions. This is actually a custom neck strap, Gary, that my dad made for me years ago. And it's custom green to go with my hair. Actually, he made it green before my hair was green. And then I dyed my hair green. And there's so many wardrobe clothes in my closet that are also green. Also, how many times can I say the word green in the sentence? <laughs> Um, but it's got some extra padding on it. Somebody was also Instagram messaging me recently asking about the strap. It's not any type of um, special strap, I think. I don't know. I have to ask him, actually. Dad, what type of strap is this underneath? I'm pretty sure it's a very standard sack strap, and he added some cushion to it and did his magic on it. <laughs> This is a song request. Hey, that's also, speaking of some of my favorite saxophonists, that's Paul Desmond that played on that Dave Brubeck record of the legendary song Take Five. Thank you, Kasmanov, for your wonderful YouTube comment. He's tuned in from Moscow, so far away in Moscow. Oh, that's so sweet. He's saying your freestyle and dances are very sexy and inspiring. And which of modern musicians inspired you recently? Thank you for the live stream. Wait for your gig in Moscow. I might be back to Moscow, my friend, in 2019. Um, there's talks that I might be doing more with a Moscow Philharmonic Orchestra, which would be really very cool. So, <laughs> so I'm saying, what am I going to be for Halloween? Me and my boyfriend might be Vikings. We don't. Maybe. Let's see. That would be really fun. So I'm also really looking forward to my trip coming up in October. I'm going to Korea, and right now I'm trying to learn much more about traditional Korean instruments and Korean folk songs. So that's been a cool thing on my mind. By the way, keep your comments coming. If you have any song requests or questions, I know there's a lot of questions coming in, so... Um, Forgive me if I'm a little slow answering all of them. But as always, I like to keep track of them, and I, I always put them in a little spreadsheet after for these great, uh, these great questions. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some questions that have come up this past week. Somebody was asking me about opportunities. They were saying, how do you get opportunities in the music business? 
and how do you get to work with well-known artists? It's a great question. And for any artist friends out there, do we have any artist friends? Hearts, hearts, hearts. Or any aspiring musicians? I saw some comments of, um, of some musicians. This is a really important, big question. The first thing is you got to put in the work. Honestly, doing anything well means that you have to put in the hours of practice time, of, of just putting in the hard work. Um, I got a question that also pertains to this about the best way to practice one's scales and creating a regimen. And scales are a perfect example of literally sitting your butt down and just saying, I'm going to get through the A major scale today with the metronome on 70 BPM. And I'm going to practice it really slowly. And I'm going to finish. I'm only going to finish my practice session once I get that perfectly down. And it's going to be executed. And then I'm going to do it in thirds. Anyways, I digress a little bit. But what I was saying is you need to put in the hard work first um, as an aspiring professional artist and musician, and the opportunities come later. And here's the big thing about this. You never know when the opportunities are going to come. So the most important thing that you need to do is to prepare because it would be a shame for an opportunity to come and then not be ready for it. Granted, I'm saying all this. Um, uh, th let me also rephrase that by saying there's always opportunities that are going to come. But it's best to be able to capitalize on those and jump into a situation being prepared so that other opportunities can come. And uh, I've never thought about opportunities or networking in my head as very important things that I needed to chase. It's more like I really spent the time of practicing on my own and trying to get really good at my craft and doing my own thing and opportunities just started to come and I was prepared for those, th those opportunities and then more started to come. And it really started on a very basic level of, you know, I was in middle school, just starting saxophone, and I went out to some local jam sessions. My parents drove me, and my music teacher was, he was the um, facilitator in some of those jam sessions, and I started to meet other local musicians, and I literally, like, went up, and I was terrified, <laughs> and I played, like, the one song I was working on. Maybe it was St. Thomas. <laughs> And I got through it, and I remember after that jam session meeting a few local musicians and some people saying to me, hey, you sound great. Do you want to sit in at my show? Um, and I came from, you know, Boston, Massachusetts. It's, it's full of incredible musicians and music professors. The Berklee College of Music that is there, New England Conservatory. So very, very blessed to grow up in a place where music um, was plentiful. So it literally just started from that place of going out to jam sessions, meeting other musicians. I think it is definitely important to go out and see live shows. If there's a musician that you love and they're coming to your town, oh my God, please go see them. It breaks my heart when I hear people say that they didn't hear about a musician coming to town. It's really easy nowadays because you can just go to websites like Bands in Town and you can track artists and they'll literally, like, the internet will give you a notification of when that person is coming to your city. By the way, you can do that on my page, which is Bands in Town slash Grace Kelly. Go see that musician. Uh, I went to so many concerts when I was younger, jazz clubs. My parents, again, I was in middle school and high school, but I, my parents would take me and... Um, the clubs would make an exception because I was under 18 and I'd get to meet these legendary musicians after their show and tell them that I played saxophone and and um, actually create a human to human connection. And I think that's a really important thing today and always will be, even though we have the internet and that's an amazing way for us to connect. Look at us all on this live stream. There's also nothing that beats literally going out to meet somebody that you admire and like shaking their hand and telling them that you're 
a fan. I love to do that with musicians that I admire. Remember the first time I met John Batiste? We were uh, we met in New York City. I went to one of his gigs, and I continued to go to his shows. And I told him how much I loved his music and how much I would love to play with him and in his band. And um, years later, I got to play with him and his band quite a lot on on national television. Which again, that's nothing I ever planned, or I, that's not an opportunity that I thought of. It uh, it just very organically happened. So. It is so, so important for all my musician, artist friends out there to put in the work and get great at your craft and your skill. There's nothing that is more important than your reputation in any field. And so word spreads really fast. And it's amazing how, you know, I've gotten texts and phone calls and emails from people in the music industry saying, you know, would you would you get on this gig or and I didn't even know that they'd heard of me and in today's world it's easier than ever to put up content you can literally press a button on YouTube and publish yourself so um, as you are able to put yourself out there continue to just grit get great at your craft and it's definitely being an artist and being a creator is a very mm, it can be very lonely at times. There's a lot of solitude that comes with it, and there's a lot of hours that you need to spend just alone in your room, literally just practicing scales. And, um, you know, I've spent so many hours just doing that. But the good news is once you do get to that level that then you're playing with people and you're jamming and you're out there and you're making content and for me to go out and play a live show wow that is like an outpour of beautiful social interactions and I've made so many new friends but um I literally would not be able to be in this place or get to the level that I am without chomping away at those scales and listening to so many recordings and learning going out to shows meeting other musicians it's so so important so that's a little food for thought about that great question, which is all about getting opportunities and working. As far as the other part of that question of how do you work with well-known artists, again, that's another thing that just organically has very, it just happened in my career, and I'm incredibly blessed to have had these great mentors and people that I've gotten to work with. Um, you know, they've happened in a, um, a wide variety of ways. I remember the first time I met Harry Connick Jr., uh, he, it was actually at this underground workshop at the New England Conservatory in Boston. And I performed with a student group, and he was one of the guests uh, who was there that afternoon. It wasn't a public event, and I was, like, freaking out because, oh, my God, it's Harry Connick Jr. <laughs> And um, I remember after I, I performed, he came up to all of us and he shook each of our hands and then he pulled me in and he said, hey, I'm performing tonight. Come sit in with me in the band. And then he left. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, what? Uh, and sure enough, that night, like I went backstage and met him and he's like, hey, let's play some rhythm changes. I want to bring you up on stage. And... Um, there I am, just like on stage with Harry Connick and his full big band, and I was 16 years old, and I jumped in. But, you know, I'd, I'd practiced those rhythm changes, and um, I didn't know what song we were going to play ahead of time, but I've spent, um, yeah, the time kind of getting ready for a moment like that, and you never know when it's going to come. So just continue preparing, and that's what I continue to do every day as well. It never ends. Just sharpen that skill set, and you just keep on in the practice room and I think that's a beautiful thing about music and about being an artist that there is no end goal you just keep keep trucking and moving <laughs> song of mine called 
Lemons make lemonade. We played this in Dallas the other day. Lemons Make Lemonade. It's a song I wrote for my friend John Batiste. He recorded that on, on one of my albums, trying to figure it out with me. He did two takes, two solos on my song, and uh, he had never heard it before and just completely nailed it. Wow, what incredible musicianship. Wow, we've got friends tuned in from California and Costa Rica. That's so, so cool. Marconi, thank you so much. So uh, the other question I had from somebody this week was the question of, was there ever a time that I wanted to give up and quit music? And that is, that's a deep question. It's, um, it's a good one because I've certainly come up against moments that have been very frustrating and hard. I don't think there was an ever a moment that I thought I was going to quit music just because music is one of those things. It's just like eating and drinking water to me. It's literally so, so much in my blood and in my bones. And it, it ultimately is the thing that makes me happiest in my life that there's never a doubt in my mind that I would quit but there have been moments that have been very hard and frustrating and that I wanted to walk away for a little bit. Um, but I think all of those moments of, you know, coming and uh, getting to a wall and, and being frustrated are ultimately opportunities for growth because without those hard moments, um, there's no room for expansion. So... There was a time, a very special time when I was younger that I got the opportunity to write a full orchestration for the Boston Pops Orchestra. And I actually created that opportunity for myself. I was originally only supposed to perform with the orchestra, which in itself, like, was such a surreal thing. I've literally grown up listening to the Boston Pops Orchestra. I think they're one of the best orchestras in the entire world. And uh, I remember I was talking to the conductor, Keith Lockhart, and we were discussing what songs I was going to perform. And then I said to him, it, well, Keith actually, he said to me, I know that you're a composer, so I want to... Um, I want to feature your composition and we'll break it down so it's just going to be piano, bass, drums and you for your original song. And I looked at him and I said, well, Mr. Lockhart, what about the entire orchestra? Could I write for the whole orchestra? <laughs> and he said, Ugh, have you ever done that before, Grace? Um, and I was like, no, but how hard could it be, right? And then he was like, well, um, if you feel so inclined, sure, you can, you can write for the orchestra, but I'm going to need to see the drafts and ultimately we can only perform it if it's perfect because this you know this is the pops and it needs to only be three minutes long and I was like sure okay <laughs> so all of a sudden I basically like um created this opportunity of writing for one of the best orchestras in the world and I literally had never written for violins or cellos or French horns before and I didn't know what to do and I also didn't want to 
back away from from this commitment because I, you know, I I thought it could be an exciting thing. So I remember spending the next few months with my composition teacher, literally learning all about violins and cellos. It was literally a crash course in orchestral arranging. And there were so many days and moments that I just wanted to throw the friggin' arrangement book on the ground and walk away from the whole thing. It was really stressful. And there was also so many moments during that time that Keith Lockhart's voice kept ringing in my head of, you know, this has got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. This is the pops. And, you know, I realized that I was entering um, at a very high level. Basically, I had to write a song not for like a student group, but for one of the you know, the, there was a lot at stake. And um, so I was kind of panicking through the whole process because I was worried so much about the final product instead of instead of enjoying the process of learning about all these instruments. And I think the reason why I wasn't really enjoying the process is because I was so worried about the time crunch because I really only had a few months. And it's like, how do you learn all of that new information in that time? But you know what, um, we, my teacher was incredibly helpful and I spent those next few months just learning all about orchestration. I don't even think I was practicing saxophone during that time. It was just like a crash course and learning, 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 writing, 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 writing. And sure enough, the time did come where I had to show the draft to Keith Lockhart and it was basically, he was either going to say yes or no. And I'd worked months on this and I was... I was completely, I had my heart set on this working. (laughs) And he looked at my score. I wrote a 40-page score for the orchestra, and he said, looks good. Let's do it. And I remember the butterflies in my heart, and I remember the first time that the violins played my notes and standing there as the soloist and, like, wanting to cry because it sounded great. And obviously, I know a lot more about orchestration and music now. That was years ago but I think for the moment uh, I was incredibly proud of what we'd created and ultimately Keith had said had given it the green light I think if I think back to what I would have done differently now um, I definitely would have put less pressure on myself for the perfection part and really enjoyed the process more because ultimately music is this incredible journey and every day is this amazing learning space You know, every time I pick up the saxophone, every time I sing, I'm learning something new. And when you're when I was so focused in on how it needed to be perfect and the end result, I lost sight of the enjoyment of the learning process. And deadlines can be very stressful. um, But ultimately, you know, your what's the worst that that's going to happen? The arrangement wouldn't get done. I didn't want that to happen, but. Uh, and it didn't happen. It still was. It happened. It was successful. Um, but there's no reason to put literally like crazy amount of soul crushing pressure on oneself when it could be um, a very fun and um, stimulating process. So nowadays, I definitely try to look at any big projects that come around with much more um, empathy towards myself and. I think if I look at anything in much more of a playful, fun way, then I'm much more prone to do it. That's just my personal personality. I noticed that as soon as something feels stagnant and like I have to do it, like a chore, I don't want to do it. So it's all about uh, phrasing it the right way in my own mind and then sparks fly. So if I'm if I sit down, I'm like, hey, I'm going to write a orchestral arrangement today and learn about French horns. Then I'm like, yay, let's do it. But if I say to myself, like, you better get this done perfectly and then you got to, like, nail the, the range of the French horns and because there's definitely that little devil in my head that does that all the time, then I want to put it off till tomorrow and the next day. So there it is. There's my little spiel about that. <laughs> Heather is saying you've got amazingly supportive parents. I do. I have incredible parents. 
such cheerleaders. And my mom was saying, it was like a dream. And I had less than two months. Oh my God, I thought I had three months. Wow, I did that orchest orchestration in two months. See how much of a panic I was in? I don't even remember the amount of time. <laughs> um, so we have a friend saying, I'm at work. I wish I could stay. I'll rewatch later. Yes, this is going to stay up, this live stream. I wanted you to know if it would be okay if I mean, please make an animated GIF. That would be awesome. I'd love to see it. Guzmana, you are so welcome for the advice. Um, oh, for the rhythm. Yes, last week we talked about the rhythm. I'm glad that's helpful. Federico is saying the painful hair pulling moments in the practice room make you truly cherish the magical music making moments with colleagues. That is so true. It's like after you put in all of the hard work and the practice time, the best feeling is then getting to jam with others and turn off all the theory in your head and just get to make music. And that is the reward. And that's why... I continually go back to the practice room. I continually want to learn new things so that I can implement it in live performance. I can implement it when I'm jamming with others. And there's really no greater feeling of like practicing something and then being able to nail it. That's a, a continual, um, that's a continual thing. <laughs> MC Falafel, I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking me. So what else is going on? Do we have any other questions from you guys? I heard this song recently. It reminded me how much I love, I love this one. Um, how does it go? <laughs> I'm like, I love this song. How does it go? That's it's like hidden, it's like magic. But uh I'm a bedroom pianist. <laughs> that means I play for myself and I don't usually play publicly, so you might be hearing some wrong chords. I do like to write on the keys. Somebody's saying they just fell they just uh sang along. I love that. You won't be able to hear the keys sound. Ooh, what a tease. You can see it, but you can't hear it. 
But if you go over to my YouTube or my Facebook or Twitch, you'll be able to hear it. It's just because we can't link in the sound on the phone. La 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 I actually never really studied classical saxophone. For a quick second, I had some lessons with a wonderful um, classical player, Ken Radnofsky. But I've always studied jazz. But I have a lot of respect for people like Branford Marcellus, who are brilliant at playing jazz saxophone and classical saxophone. And it can be done at that incredibly high level. I also have some friends who started on classical clarinet and then moved to jazz saxophone. I think it's easier to go from classical to jazz. Um, because, you know, you're, you've already been so rigorously learning technique. I think a lot of times in jazz, you learn technique and all that, but it's kind of, you know, it's okay if it's sloppier or if it has more swag to it, because that's just part of the language. And then it's really hard to go to the other end of, like, the precision of classical music. That's what I had the most hard time with, of, like, changing my articulation and literally having to change my whole saxophone setup to have a classical sound when I'm so in love with a jazz sound so um, it absolutely can be done. Uh, I just haven't been on that path. This is a great song request coming in from Bernard. Let's see if I can play a little bit on keys. It's also a one octave piano, so that's why you're just hearing an octave for those of you on Facebook and YouTube. I love this song. I haven't sang it in a really long time. Um, wow, I'm just forgetting songs today. I keep just hearing what a wonderful world in my head. I guess I must be in a very positive place. <laughs> um, come on, Grace. Oh, here we go. It's not the pale moon that excites me. That thrills and delights me. sweet conversation that brings this sensation oh no it's just the nearness of you this is such a sweet love song when you're in my wonderful song request Gary so great to see these comments I know some of you have to sign off I'm glad that some of you are still sticking around I'm enjoying hanging with all of you I, I also love that song so much I know a lot of you are commenting saying cadet someone on Instagram is saying make merch we're actually in the process my team is in the process right now I'm making some GK merch 
some swag. So I'd love to hear from you guys what you would be most interested in rocking, whether it be t-shirts or coffee cups. I also had this idea of creating socks. Like, I think it'd be really fun to have saxophone socks. What do you guys think? Would you wear that? Would you buy them? I love socks. And they're also really easy to pack um, for when I go out on the road and then I have, like, a merch table. I don't know. I think it'd be kind of cute. DK sax socks. <laughs> I'm going to make some pins. and But I'm open to all sorts of ideas. One friend was saying that I should make blue hair extensions for for my merch <laughs> I don't know how many of you would wear that I would wear them I think it'd be really fun Frederico is saying I jam along to your tunes on my trombone ah that's amazing I love love hearing that Wonderland thank you for tuning in from London so my friends I wanted to glad you dig the socks idea I wanted to um give a little food for thought for my music friends out there Last week, I left you guys with this idea about integrating improvisation with silence. And I gave a demonstration of playing for three bars, resting for one bar, and then playing for another three bars, and then mixing it up, doing two bars, two bars. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go to my YouTube channel and check out last week's Sunny Sundays because I actually gave an exercise on improvisation. And I hope that's been helpful. Some of you are commenting saying it was cool and that you've been working on it. Uh, I got a question on YouTube from somebody saying, Hi, Grace. What are some tips of how to structure your practice time? I have been playing the alto for one year now, and I still need a lot of breaks when practicing. Great. Uh, oh, greetings from Germany. And my friend George Wooley said, how do you practice scales effectively? So if you're just starting saxophone, that's totally normal to need to take some breaks if you're practicing for an hour or an hour and a half just because your embouchure is going to get tired. And I would recommend taking some breaks you don't want to completely burn out your lips. So here is kind of the rundown of my structured practice time when I do get to dig in and practice. I like to start with long tones, overtones, and work on sound. Up and down the saxophone, quiet, loud, quiet, loud. Then I work on my um, technical stuff, so scales. In different configurations, in thirds, in fourths. By the way, Instagram friends, Instagram is going to shut off in a minute and 45 seconds, but we're still going, so hop on over to Facebook and YouTube to continue joining me. So I might mix up the fourths um, in groupings of threes. There's always something different to do with scales, something that you can keep challenging yourself with. Or you could do groupings of fives, you could do groupings of sevens. Um, that's really fun because it challenges playing over the bar line. Okay, so after that, um, I work on transcribing. So I pick some of my favorite music, my favorite song, or I might be transcribing a Cannonball Adderley solo, and I'll listen to that solo over and over and over again. I'll sing it. This is my process of transcribing. I want to be able to sing it backwards before I even touch my saxophone. And then once I can sing the whole solo inside out, I pick up my horn and I start to transcribe it four bars at a time. If I have limited time for my practice, I might just pick eight bars. And then I will literally like chop up those eight bars, put them into GarageBand and loop them. And I will try to mimic I will uh, as closely as possible. So if I'm transcribing a Cannonball Adderley solo, I will literally try to do a note bend every time he does it, a growl, an articulation. I just want to sound as much like Cannonball as possible. Um, and then I do that for the whole solo. So that's my transcription. And then I always like to add... Uh, and I always like to end my practice sessions with jams because I think it's really important to have fun at the end of a practice session. And I put on my favorite recordings and the headphones and I literally just jam along with it. And there we go. That's to the extent of uh, 
that's what I do in my practice time. Obviously, it differs sometimes if I need to learn new music for a gig, if I'm, you know, a side woman on someone else's gig, or if I'm writing a lot of new music, my time will be more towards that. There's also times that I like to put in, I, I should actually do this more. It's great to have a little bit of time where you work on sight reading, because if you are a session musician and a lot of your work comes from reading, then it's important to just keep sharpening that skill. Um, also, putting in some ear training and singing is a great thing to put in your in your practice time. If you are a saxophonist, I highly or a singer, I highly recommend that you also start to learn some basic chord stuff on keys or on guitar, and that will really help with the theory part of it. So there we go. That's my practice session in a nutshell. I hope that's helpful to my music friends out there. If it is, definitely leave a comment or if you have other questions about that. Michael, we will definitely try to reschedule Atlanta. I'm so sorry that we weren't able to be with you guys that time. It breaks my heart. I was very much looking forward to it. Stephen, thank you so much for, for tuning in. I'm actually not sure what the answer to that is, but send me an email about it. Michael, hello. Thanks for coming. Um, we got some other people joining us. Thank you guys so much. I, uh, I'm wondering if you have any other questions or song requests. Um, if you, if you uh, don't, that's cool because I'm going to play you a few more songs. And mm, this is one of mine. Again, for my friends just tuned in, I have a small keyboard that you can't see. It's magic. <laughs> this is one of my songs. This for my mom, based upon her very inspiring words when I was having a tough time that day. I've met my heartache, drank the bottle dry, my tears of sadness, salt has stained my eyes, I've been let down. Some days I didn't want to try But I stuck around Lies to the dreamers It's all I've known The ups and downs On this bumpy road I'm trying for something the light will bring me home we're all trying to figure it out I will not let the blues break me I will not let the blues take me I've done my time to cry my woes No sorries for the taking One step and then another And slowly we discover We may not be perfect Or the way we planned But we're all Keep your head high and do the best you can. And you know we're all trying to figure it out. <laughs>
It's a song of mine called Trying to Figure It Out from my album, Trying to Figure It Out. It's also on a more recent one, Go Time Brooklyn. So my friends, as you know, I love to do these hangouts just for you on Sundays. And if for some reason I'm touring, we reschedule them. But I do shoot for Sundays. This is the first time La Marita is joining us. She says hi. And uh, if you're enjoying it, please, please, please invite some friends in for next week. There's nothing more fun than being live and seeing all your comments and getting to talk with all of you about sexy socks and stickers and stuff and stories. So definitely invite your friends in. In the future live streams, I'm also going to be doing some giveaways. So uh, I hope that sounds exciting. And as always, you can find out all about live performances and if I'm going to be in your city on my Bands in Town page. This is going to stay up on YouTube and on Facebook um, and on Twitch. So I am sending much, much love to all of you. <laughs> oh, Mike, Asher's doing wonderfully. I think uh, he's with my parents now. I, I saw a picture of him the other day. He looked very cute. He always looks cute. Sending much love to you guys. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you have a wonderful start to your week. Mwah. Bye for now. <laughs> Ciao, everybody. Bye, YouTube and Facebook and Twitch. <laughs>